Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Alekos Theologis, one of the spine surgeons at UCSF. Um, thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, we have a talk and our interesting case presentations will be on state-of-the-art on lumbar pedicle subtraction osteotomies for spinal deformity. Um, as, as a way of outline, give a little historical background on lumbar PSOs, which is quite interesting. Um, it's been a huge evolution over time, and I think it's important to know where we uh, started and to know where we should go. We'll briefly touch upon the different types of lumbar, lumbar pedicle subtraction osteotomies, what the ideal level should be based on deformities, and then really dive deep into reconstructive options, which seem to be a moving target. Um, that will be for the first 30 minutes, and then we'll follow with three beautiful cases by uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Aaron Clark from the neurosurgery team here, uh, my right-hand man, uh, Dr. Rafi Kazar, a fellow, and then Dr. Jay Shaw, one other fellow is going to present, but he's in the OR, so um, Dr. Bourbon will be presenting his case. So uh, to move through the historical perspective, um, back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, um, we didn't have Russa Lee, we didn't have people like Dr. Bourbon to um, really set the groundwork for the sagittal plane, and mild deformities really probably weren't um, known about. But those patients who were very, uh, who stood out uh, were those patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And so in the 1940s, uh, Smith Peterson devised a osteotomy um, named after himself, Smith Peterson osteotomy, which uh, was used to correct uh, the sagittal plane in the uh, ankylosing spondylitis patients. As many of us know, this was a posterior based operation that involved removal of the facets. Um, and then this was followed by an extension type uh, mechanism, which cracked the uh, anterior column, which was auto fused um, because of the disease process. A year later, um, interestingly, this is something that's been overlooked. La Chapelle uh, performed a similar type of operation, but this was performed in two steps. Um, this was from his original article. And really what this involved was a similar approach where the facets were removed at L2-3 bilaterally with local anesthesia. And then two weeks later, um, he opened the discs between the second and third lumbar vertebrae from the front um, using total anesthesia, thankfully. Um, and then he lordosed the lumbar spine, filled the open disc space with bone blocks, and post-operative treatment was three months in a plaster spica and then a plaster jacket for another three months. Um, this is a nice representation of that type of osteotomy by La Chapelle. Um, both pictorially as well as from a radiographic standpoint, as you see on the right. Now, while this was the mainstay of treatment at that time, um, there were concerning case reports of catastrophic and deadly vascular injuries, um, some of which were delayed in fashion. You can see here two reports of vascular injuries resulting in death from the classic Smith-Peterson osteotomy. Um, and I won't go through the post-mortem findings, but essentially, um, they found um, injuries to the aortic wall um, at the level of the um, osteotomy. No bony fragments were, it wasn't a penetrating injury, it was more of a sheer injury. So that led others to try to find an, a safer approach. Um, Scudese in 1963, I would say this is a mini PSO, if you will, or a form of it where he took off a posterior superior corner of L3 and the L2-3 disc, and then um, created some lordosis through wedging the disc base and that uh, defect in the body. The correction from these, this was also for ankylosing spondylitis, um, but the correction from these wasn't robust. And that was followed by the PSO that we're all um, accustomed to these days. Um, Thomason in 1985, in this classic um, groundbreaking article in CORE, uh, described his approach. This was performed at L2, interestingly. Um, removal of the posterior elements, complete facetectomies above and below, and the removal of the pedicles as well as the transverse processes, taking a wedge of bone um, from the back. Now, the, there really was a sagittal plane awakening um, thereafter. You know, Dubousset talked about his cone of economy. Um, we had a lot more focus on the radiographic alignment in terms of um, distribution of low doses, um, type of compensatory mechanisms that went into maintaining a correct sagittal plane, um, importance of varying uh, pelvic shape. Uh, Russoli gave us that and uh, shape of the spine. And then not only were we evaluating the radiographic um, parameters, 
but in these landmark articles um, with very uh, prominent names um, back in mid 2000s um, demonstrated that sagittal plane did compromise or jeopardize um, uh, outcomes in patients' functional status. And so I think this really led to um, a huge push to see how we could correct the sagittal plane ideally. You know, we started with um, uh, Thomason's original PSO technique. This then expanded to a um, extended PSO, uh, the type four in the Schwab classification where the uh, cranial disc space was also involved for greater correction. Um, Kirk Wood proposed a by uh, vertebral body osteotomy, um, including the, the entire disc and the inferior portion of the cranial vertebra. Um, and then kind of a combination of the traditional Smith-Peterson osteotomy and um, Thomason, you see the closing opening wedge osteotomy. So all different ways of cutting the spine to try to realign the sagittal plane. Now, this really was mirrored in the use of PSOs um, being used considerably more than they were in the past. Um, you can see here a study by Glassman's group that over three of the time frame uh, studied, there was up to a three, nearly three and a half fold increase in the utilization of PSOs, while the diagnosis of ASD, fusion for spinal deformity and posterior spinal fusions really had no to minimal increase. So this really, in my opinion, was a wild west when it came to the sagittal plane, the use of PSOs. But I think many people got a healthy dose of reality. Um, the complications started to set in, um, not only short-term with the neurologic, you can see rates reported uh, by the WashU group, 15% uh, femoral nerve injuries, foot drops, catequina, uh, but the longer-term consequences, non-union pseudoarthrosis, some studies reporting up to 60%. And dural tears kind of um, par for the course when it comes to um, some of these operations. But the total percentage of the co total complication rate from some of these studies was quite staggering. You know, Cho reporting nearly a 60% complication rate. I think this was very humbling and really forced us to determine which patients are best suited uh, from a lumbar pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Um, I think these are the refined indications. There's some nuances to this, but um, kind of taking these all into consideration, deformity, where there's considerable sagittal imbalance globally, um, greater than 10 centimeters, secondary to a rigid deformity, um, regional deformity in the lumbar spine, lumbar pelvic mismatch that needs greater than 25 degrees of low doses correction, um, a prior surgery posteriorly based with very stiff and collapsed disc where you may not be able to achieve correction through the disc, disc spaces, and then um, circumferential fusions um, with a concomitant um, deformity in the lumbar spine. So that really, I think, led to the hunt for optimization. If we're gonna do these and we're gonna do them well, um, what is the ideal location? Is it in the upper thoracic spine? Is it at L2, where Thomason originally did it? Is it at L3, where the original um, um, PSOs were, were done, extension type, or is it lower down? Um, also, how to best stabilize it. Um, as you can see here, two rod construct um, with no inner bodies above and below. Is there a better way that we can prevent this? So let's dive deeper into each one of these um, by focusing on what's the ideal level. So I think when you're trying to choose which level to perform, there's several things to evaluate. I think it's very important to focus your correction and consider doing your PSO at the apex of deformity. Also take into consideration the degree of correction needed, the magnitude of the SVA preoperatively. Also, where are you gonna place your PSO to restore the shape of the spine uh, most appropriate as um, presented by Rousseli? How are we gonna restore his, um, which type they may have been um, before surgery? And then also things to consider are prior surgeries. Um, inner body cages in the front, we're gonna have a nice uh, presentation by Aaron Clark on removal of a posterior, uh, uh, removal of an anterior cage during a PSO from the back. And then if they had in prior ALF cages with screws or plates. Um, so all these things need to be taken into consideration when planning your level. Um, in terms of you know, what level is best for correcting SVA and the sagittal plane, initial study by Lafage in 2011 um, looked at L3 versus L4 PSOs. They said that L4, so more distal caudal, 
PSOs um, had a better improvement of posterior uh, pelvic tilt, but really didn't have any influence on the SVA. Now, most recently, a very uh, new study in Global Spine by Coleman demonstrated that a PSO level was an independent predictor for change in the T1 uh, slope, pelvic incidence, and the S global SVA with more caudal PSOs corresponding to a greater correction in the global sagittal balance. Um, they stated that a gain of three degrees and three centimeters of correction for each level of PSO more distal to L1. So the more distal you go, in, based on his paper, the better correction you have is simulated in that right image. Um, I'll show you a couple of patients of mine. Um, so this is a lady presented with a flat back from a very flat L4 to S1 adjacent segment disease, lumbar pelvic mismatch and global sagittal alignment. Also has some cervical deformity, so that plays into some of the compensatory mechanisms here, but it had a high pelvic tilt at 38 degrees. And um, we chose to do, to address the deformity a little bit higher. Um, we did an L3-4 um, inner body from a direct lateral approach and then a extended PSO at L3. And you can see here SVA improved, but her pelvic tilt remained a little high. So maybe what um, Lafage was telling us about higher PSOs not pregnant pelvic tilt does seem to hold true. This is another patient of mine, um, very severe regional deformity, lumbar spine um, fracture that went on to heal in a kyphotic position. You can see here a very high pelvic tilt again, 33 degrees and an SVA of 13 centimeters. Um, this is a patient that we did an L2 to S1 agelift. Um, and then we did an L5 PSO to really help restore that L4 um, to S1 low doses as optimally as possible. And again, very good correction of the SVA and the pelvic tilt um, also improved considerably. That also probably came about from a nice A-lift cage um, at L5S1. But it does really speak to addressing deformities at their apex. Um, I think um, this does hold true in this case. Another patient of mine, we did a front back operation and they get L1 cranially. About six weeks post-op, he fell. He had this very unique uh, chance fracture through the UIV with the associated compression fracture with compromise in his sagittal alignment. And um, we ended up doing an L1 PSO for him. And um, again, addressing the deformity at its apex to help restore his sagittal alignment regionally as well as globally. I think when we're talking about apex of the deformity, we also really have to consider Rousselli's classification, um, the spine shape, the apex of lordosis. This is one of his uh, original articles in 2005. And I bring it up because pelvic shape changes. Um, you can see here that patients with low pelvic incidence have quite a bit lower pelvic tilt. They have differences in their um, apex of lordosis in the lumbar spine. And um, you can see here based on his four different types, um, with the low grade PIs having a lower pelvic tilt um, where the apex is of the lordosis is more distal. Whereas if you get to the higher pelvic incidence, you see that apex lordosis going into the L3-4 disc area um, with a much higher pelvic tilt that may be quote unquote acceptable. So I think the prior proposed targets are quite simplistic. Um, and I think um, aren't necessarily those that we should focus on. Now, my working targets have tried to condense a lot of what I've read to a, a simpler table and targets that I can uh, digest in clinic and hopefully will be useful to you. Um, I consider patients low PI, middle PI, and high PI with uh, their lumbar lordosis targets. Um, for low PI patients, I shoot for a lumbar lordosis of more than 10 degrees, middle PI plus or minus five degrees, and then high PI patients, I try to shoot for about 10 degrees less. Um, when it comes to the L4S1 target, um, this ends up being about 35 to 40 degrees for everybody, but the percentage of, of the PI and low doses is, is different based on their degree of PI. The apex of low doses, again, based on Rousselli, um, the low PI patients are quite a bit lower and the high PI starts creeping up cranially. And the pelvic tilt, again, I think the targets are different based on the PIs with those that are high, maybe 25 to 30 would be acceptable with those that are low, less than 15, uh, maybe quote unquote, um, better for them. Now, this is a patient of mine um, presented with a multiplanar deformity, had a prior L4 to S1 uh, uh, posterior instrument effusion with radiolucent rods. Uh, you can see it was used quite flat, then underwent an A-lift at L3-4, 
and now is presenting with adjacent segment disease um, and coronal deformity, as well as a uh, sagittal deformity, which is, an, uh, which is a little bit trickier and nuanced. If we look at the parameters, she's a low pelvic incidence patient with a PI of 41, pelvic tilt of 19, which is, in my opinion, high for this. And then you can see here L4 to S1, lordosis is 13, and her overall lordosis is 32. Um, so she would fit into this category. In order to really, I think, correct her deformity appropriately, both coronally and um, sagittally, I think we planned on doing a low uh, PSO to achieve that L4 to S1 lordosis. Um, so these are the original L5 PSO, which got her up 10 degrees above her PI, which is our goal, her pelvic tilt less than 15, and then her L4 to S1 lordosis, um, maybe a little bit too much correction, but um, around where we shot. And I think this restored her Rousseli type uh, as planned. And coronally, um, we we're also able to use the L5 PSO asymmetrically to bring her back um, more to the left side. So um, I think that next brings us to how best to stabilize these. And this has gone through a lot of iterations and there's been a lot of nice work from a biomechanical standpoint in this realm. And also some clinical studies showing the same findings. So one of the first techniques that was used to minimize um, rod strain and rod breakage, especially with the use of two rods um, posteriorly, is to place cages um, adjacent to the PSO both cranial and caudal. Uh, Vidat Devran, one of my colleagues here at UCSF, uh, did a really nice um, study image on the right where he found that there was a 26% reduction in axial rotation, 22% increase in fatigue bending, uh, dynamic stiffness in PSOs compared to a PSO group without adjacent inner body cages. Luca looked at the effect of two inner body cages, so one cranial, one caudal, um, compared to one inner body cage adjacent to a PSO site and found that sandwiching it really uh, provided much less um, uh, load and strain on the rods. Um, several other studies have looked at rod types um, and the amount of rod bending. So Lindsay um, found that titanium rods had lower fatigue life than stainless steel rods and that rod contouring lowered fatigue life of the titanium rod constructs. Um, interestingly, Luca, uh, same author um, found that bilateral 6 O titanium rods had less stress across PSO sites than cobalt chrome rods and five and a half millimeter rods. And then Tang um, image on the right from their paper found that the degree of rod bending um, really was what affected the fatigue life of the rods more so than the type of rod. You can see here with greater uh, angulation, the fatigue life uh, decreases considerably. Um, this, I think, was one of the reasons that people started considering using multi-rod contracts, which we'll go into, um, recessed rods, um, satellite rods, to minimize how much bend would have to go across a hyper-lordotic uh, segment. So that does bring us to multi-rod contracts. The real question is, how many rods are best? Is it two, is it three, four, five, six, seven? You know, it seems to get more and more these days. Um, clearly, two rods, in my opinion, are insufficient. I know some people do it, and I think that may be a discussion point um, during our case discussions. And then multi-rod constructs, um, as demonstrated by Mubish Gupta, probably the first person to write on multi-rod versus uh, dual rod, stated that the um, rate of pseudothrosis and rod fractures are considerably lower uh, for the multi-rod constructs. Um, recently, um, we did a study um, with finite element analyses, looking at these multi-rod or super multi-rod constructs, two versus four versus five versus six across the PSO. Um, and we found that the five and six rod constructs, these super multi-rod constructs decreased rod stresses. However, it resulted in considerably less load transfer and forces through the PSO site. So there's a lot of stress shielding. Um, and so whether this affects the anterior column healing, I think is TBD, but it's definitely something that can take into consideration where um, more rods may not be necessarily better when it comes to healing of the anterior column. When it comes to multi-rod constructs, it's important to at least understand the nomenclature. Accessory rod, um, excuse me, is one that where the rods connect to the primary rods and the satellite rods are those that are not connected to the primary rods. Um, 
the WashU group led by um, Mish Gupta put out a nice comprehensive classification system for this. And I think it's worth reading just to be in vogue with the nomenclature. Um, the, another finite element, element analysis looked at the optimal satellite uh, or the um, multi-rod constructs, looking at rods that were placed, accessory rods that were placed laterally, accessory rods that were placed medial, um, and then satellite rods, the inline recess satellite rods on the right are something that's um, definitely popular. And they found that all of the rods decreased, um, increased the rigidity of the construct, decreases the force across the PSO and um, takes the strain off the rods. That last point there, number four, except for the short recess rod technique, all of the multi-rod contracts decrease the magnitude of load across the osteotomy site, which could cause a delayed or non-union at the PSO site. So the short inline recessed um, satellite rods in this study were um, thought to be potentially biomechanically ideal. Now, I have adopted a, a different technique that involves the use of a recessed rod, but I use this as a way of stabilizing the PSO while performing the PSO. You can see here, these are satellite rods that are laterally based. Um, so it gives you a nice corridor to um, take out the pedicles, do all your decompression, remove your post to your wall, um, and not have to do any rod exchanges. Um, then you can compress across them. They are also recessed, so then you can place another long rod in your midline so that you don't have um, um, to make those acute bends at the PSO site. And this ends up being uh, the final rod construct. Um, we just put out a paper on the surgical technique, a video paper uh, will be coming out in clinical spine surgery soon. So keep an eye out for it. Um, I will, I think, skip the video just in the sake of time, but um, the nice thing about this technique also is that you can address the sagittal plane um, as well as the coronal plane. So the lady who presented with, you can see a sagittal plane deformity from a prior L3 to 5 uh, fusion. Um, she also had a leg length discrepancy and a, a scoliosis through her lumbar spine. We ended up doing an L3 PSO at the um, deformity and um, did it asymmetrically to bring her over to the left. Um, now, we also did a study looking at these uh, lateral satellite rods compared to the inline satellite rods um, recessed. And we found that these lateral satellite rods had subtle biomechanical differences um, and were better for increasing the forces across the PSO. Um, we don't have any clinical data to support any benefit over the other, but um, I do think it's a viable technique that I, I like doing. Um, and I think it can be considered in your toolbox um, when performing these. So in conclusion, um, lumbar PSOs have a long history that has definitely evolved over time. Um, and I think we've gotten to hopefully a nice medium in terms of uh, performing them in the right setting. It is a correct, a powerful corrective technique that should be reserved for stiff prior fused spines associated with considerable sagittal deformity regionally and or globally. Um, and safety, prior, safety profile has improved but there are very complex operations um, and with very potential for great risk. Reconstructive options are heterogeneous. Multiple rods are better than two rods. Um, you can create them with satellite and accessory rods and then cage above and below PSO site definitely decrease the rod strain. So um, we'll move into our interesting case presentations now that we're about half an hour in. So the first case will be um, from Dr. Clark. Um, he's one of the neurosurgeons, associate professor here at UCSF, um, good friend of mine, and um, we'll present a case that we did together. Aaron, take it away. Well, thank you, Alekos, and thanks everybody for having us. Um, I'm uh, excited to present this case. Um, I think it is an interesting type of PSO to treat a couple different problems going on with this, this patient. But by way of history, uh, this patient, she is 62 when she first saw me in clinic, and she had a combination of both mechanical low back pain and also pretty significant left leg pain. Um, she did have um, a pretty involved past surgical history. It started with an L4-5 T-lift, 
um, developed adjacent level disease and was treated with an L3-4 XLIF and um, extension of her posterior spinal fusion. And ultimately, for somewhat unclear reasons, uh, the posterior hardware was removed. And, and I do think that that's part of, the, part of her issue as well. On neurologic examination, she was four out of five strengths, fairly diffusely and pain limited in her bilateral lower extremities, and also really had some trouble standing upright. She was in fact using a walker pretty much at all times when um, when when she came and saw me. And I think from our next slides, you'll be able to see why. Uh, so starting with her um, full length Scoliosis x-rays um, in the coronal plane, she had mild degenerative scoliosis um, with, uh, with about three centimeters of coronal imbalance. And in the sagittal plane, she's fairly malaligned. She has um, a pelvic incidence of, um, of 70, but a lumbar lordosis of 40, so 30 degree mismatch. Uh, similar to what Dr. Theologis had mentioned, she did have an elevated pelvic tilt at 31 and about 13 centimeters um, of, uh, of positive sagittal imbalance. On her MRI scan, um, in, particularly in the, in the lower lumbar spine, she, you can tell that she does have some transitional anatomy here. And at the location of her prior fusions and hardware removal, uh, you can see in both the right and the left uh, parasagittal views on this MRI T1 weighted image that she has very significant foraminal stenosis, which could be the explanation for her leg pain. Uh, for the sake of, um, of time here, I did not include the CT scan, but I think as you can tell from the, um, from the x-rays, she did have pseudarthrosis through uh, both of the inner body spaces. Uh, which, which again called into question as to why she had that hardware removed. And so in thinking about this plan um, and how, how best to treat her, she has both uh, coronal and sagittal malalignment. Um, she has a loss of lumbar lordosis and also pseudarthrosis and fairly significant braminal stenosis. And so the way that, that we had devised to treat to treat this was initially starting with an L5S1 ALIF um, to give some lordosis with a, with a lordotic implant. Um, and then as a planned second stage, a T10 to pelvis posterior spinal fusion. And in this case, we had opted for a type four osteotomies, which is uh, again, a, a PSO plus removal of the superior disc. Um, at the L5 level. And part of this was to achieve um, more significant correction um, and also was, uh, was gonna allow us the opportunity to remove that, um, that cage at the pseudarthrosis level. Um, and then give, by removing the disc, really give very, very good bone on bone contact to hopefully promote a good fusion through the osteotomy site. One of the challenges that we have, particularly when doing the L5 PSOs, is having um, both proximal and distal control of the osteotomy site. And so what we've started doing in certain cases is using S2AI screws um, to help uh, with, uh, with the ability to stand, span the main rod um, in a continuous fashion while still being able to use the recessed PSO rods that Dr. Theologius has talked about a minute ago. The other thing that we've been doing fairly regularly is uh, for PJK prevention is to uh, use fenestrated screws at T10 with cement installation um, and also doing a, uh, a cement augmentation uh, at the UIV plus one at, at T9. And so that's what we did. And this was our intraoperative uh, long plate, which we're able to do um, using the O-arm. And, um, and this correlated well with, uh, with what she ultimately looked like when she stood up. Um, we were happy with the, with the coronal um, realignment and uh, got her um, more well-balanced in the sagittal plane as well. And um, I'm going to show you that in the next slide, just in the um, 
before and after pictures and this is what she looked like before and then after the two-stage operation we felt like we got her back closer to where she needed to be thank you right Aaron. um i thought it was a nice case but um clearly i'm biased um definitely open it up to the the group um sig rafid any comments or anybody online I'm happy to have you weigh in on a maybe how you guys would have approached this um do you think this was necessary do we overcorrect her um also in the setting of another thing to consider which i'm not always um i'm having totally determined what i believe in the setting of transitional anatomy how do you draw your sagittal uh parameters what's your target and i think there's a lot of nice things that can be brought up in this case yeah like, let, let me start with by saying that i think your uh, your overview is terrific i think uh the notion of getting the the right shape to the spine for the right pelvic incidence is is a really important concept and the notion of doing these osteotomies lower. So thank you, Aaron, for showing a nice example of an L5. I think a really important point here too is the fact that you got the ALIF in first. Um, you know, the ALIF alone wasn't going to be enough. And I think I remember discussing this case. And and uh, uh, but you've got a really nice correction in L5. And uh, it looks like in this higher pelvic incidence, uh, it looks like you've got a really nice nice match there. I think you know as you know, Alekos, one of the things we've been looking at now is risk of PJK, and we talked about that last week. And um, you got two levels of cement there, which which will hopefully help the the T4 to L1 to pelvic axis uh, actually looks looks quite quite well there. So I don't think this is uh, I don't think this is much overcorrected. Maybe, maybe just a just a little bit, but but overall, I think you did a nice job of restoring the pelvic tilt, and that that was uh, really facilitated by doing this as low as L5. Yeah, this, I think this is a good example of addressing the deformity at its apex. Um, I think the quote unquote easier approach may have been to go a little bit higher and do it at L3, um, definitely avoid prior scar. But again, I think in, I think we have many of examples of where we try to put the apex in a different location. We address the deformity outside of its apex. And I feel like the spine just doesn't like to be in that, it's always never comfortable. And that may be one of those that just keeps having PJK or it keeps having pseudo problems because of the um, mal distribution of lordosis and just not an overall physiologic um, norm. Yeah, one, one of the real challenges I think you pointed out, uh, uh, Aaron, is, is that T-lift cage at four or five. I, I think you said that was a non-union. And uh, so getting up into that disc space, sometimes there can be, a lot, as you know, a lot of scarring around the nerve root after a T-lift. And it uh, uh, looks like you guys did, did a great job of uh, removing that safely. Yeah, I think, Sig, it's it's something that, that you've certainly taught us is one of the challenges when it comes to the type fours um, compared to type three is you have to work both above and below the nerve to really get that disc disc out. And, and I think you really highlighted it, that, that those are the challenges. Um, but in this case, we really did think it was worth it. Looks like Jens has got a, a question or a comment. The great lecture, great case, very evocative. Two questions, a mechanical question, neurologic question. Mechanical question first. These accessory or satellite rods to be optimal in your finite element analysis, should they be connected to the primary, we call it working rod, um, to offload them optimally? Because right now, this current thing, um, this current concept kind of just bypasses them, and there's not a real coupling between the primary working rod and the um, uh, satellite rod. So that's my uh, structural question. Thanks. Yeah, um, I guess I'll take that. So I agree, The when there's a satellite rod that is only spanning the PSO site, it definitely leaves open the possibility of quite a bit of translation through um, anterior translation. We've seen cases where the anterior body will fracture and you can have, because of the polyaxial screw heads, there can be this shift of the spine through that PSO site. Um, 
the part of the reason why we've supplemented that with secondary accessory rods is to give it a little bit more robust um, fixation posteriorly. But um, yeah, I don't know exactly the, the right answer to that. The inline recess ones definitely provide some benefit, especially with minimizing the contour that you have to place across the rod, decreasing the amount of fatigue that you do have across the PSO site to have a less, a, a less um, rigorous bend. But I do think that there needs to be some potential extra supplementation um, to avoid those issues I, I just mentioned. I see Amir's hand is up. I'll pass off to him. Hey there. Uh, thank you guys for presenting. Great cases and, and great review. Um, absolutely. Look forward to having you at the deformity course. A little quick shout out. So um, please join us all uh, in the next month. Um, but uh, one of the things I just wanted to bring up, um, some people have kind of shied away from the L5 PSO because they feel like there's too high of a neurologic complication rate. Um, have you seen that in your practice? It's something that I haven't done really just because other people have said they've gone away from it because of that reason. Um, I know we've seen in our kind of cohort of PSOs, um, you know, the neurologic complication rate is not small. Um, and that L5, some people feel is higher. Um, what are some of the things you do to avoid that? Or um, if not, you know, what are, what are the things that you do uh, just in general um, with that L5 PSO? Aaron, you wanna take that one? Yeah, um, I think really great question. Um, uh, and also kind of ties into what Sig had had talked about, about, um, you know, really the challenges of working, or, uh, you know, around those nerves. Um, I, uh, you know, and, and I think Alekos and I can put our heads together, but I don't know that I we've been seeing a higher rate of neurologic complications, L5 versus L4 PSO um, or higher. Um, I, I will say that when we do these, um, we're just absolutely careful and meticulous about really removing, you know, 100% of those IAPs and SAPs to, um, to really make sure when we, we have just as much space as possible when we close down that osteotomy site to make sure that, um, uh, that, that, um, that nothing's being compressed and, and feeling, you know, out, out, uh, those osteotomy sites to really convince ourselves at the end that, um, that those nerves are free. We, we, as, as I think everybody here does, we do this all um, with neuromonitoring and check motors before and after um, the closure, uh, all to confirm, you know, that, that very concern that, that, um, that you brought up. Yeah, I think. Great, this, thank you so much. Yeah, Amir, one other comment before we move on. Um, it, the L5 PSOs are tricky. Um, the L5 transverse process you know, it can be quite deep, can be quite large. Um, and I think that's one of the things we spend a lot of time on is really making sure the TP is removed. Um, I think that some, I don't exactly know where the L5 um, issues come from after a PSO, but it probably is something regarding the sacrum and maybe the TP. Um, so we're very meticulous when we take out the TP, we don't leave any loose fragments. Um, we make sure that we see all the nerve roots. Um, we take off all the flavum. Um, and then, you know, the other thing with the L5 pedicle is that the nerve tends to um, drape over the, the um, when you remove the pedicle, it tends to drape over the distal aspect of the pedicle. And if we don't really get your osteotome or however you do your um, removal, the, the posterior wall and the pedicle, there's always that little spike of bone that's right, the distal medial edge. And it, we're very meticulous about lifting that nerve up a little bit, making sure that we cut underneath that so that when we close it down, there isn't something that pinches it right um, at the takeoff as it exits the, you know, the spinal canal. So we, we definitely spend more time on making sure it's, it's safe. So uh, this is a wonderful discussion and I knew this would yeah, go ahead, uh, a couple more questions uh, here, just just from your chat that we're following, is um, uh, Sergio had asked, um, what about the shoulder girdle girdle, girdle uh, imbalance, and how do you really control the the coronal plane interoperatively, and 
I, I think, Aaron, you probably answered that with uh, uh, actually using the the arm for an intraoperative scan. And I, I do think that that's uh, useful to get to get a long film. Uh, I tend to get a short film on a lateral and a longer film on the AP. But Alekos or Aaron, you guys want to add anything to that with regard to coronal alignment? Yeah, I think it is. It's a really uh, great point, Sig, and and thank you um, for that question from from the chat box. Um, the, I think the one of the other reasons we've we've liked using the S two AI screws in combination with with traditional iliac bolts is it gives us also the opportunity to to use a kickstand rod if needed. So if we get that um, O arm long plate film and we still see that there's we're very careful about um, measuring either um, from the iliac crest or the femoral heads um, in, in, in measuring a plumb line um, up to C7 really to, to make sure that there isn't any residual kernel imbalance. And then we have the opportunity to, um, to do a kickstand rod if needed. And then the other question in there was, uh, what, what about bleeding? And maybe uh, share, share some tips uh, with regard to controlling bleeding. Uh, so especially as you're getting around the uh, the L5 body and, and maybe the recurrent uh, iliac lumbar vein, et cetera. Well, I think for for us, it's partly. Um, I think there's there's certainly bleeding from potential bleeding sources um, in eventually, and so being being really careful um, in that with our dissections, a blunt dissection. Um, being careful to stay right on bone with doing that and, and uh, dissecting out the venous structures and also the segmentals um, is really important. And then there's bleeding itself from the from the Kinsella's bone while you're working within the PSO site. And, and for us, it's really where the, the two surgeon model helps where you have, um, you have a spine surgeon on either side of the osteotomy working together and making it just go as efficiently as possible because some of that venous bleeding is going to go until that osteotomy gets closed. Very, very nice questions. Um, and I knew this case was going to spark a lot of um, interesting debate. So um, the most important slide of the whole talk. Um, so the next case will be presented by one of our fellows, Rafid Kayser. Um, he's um, one of the best fellows that we've ever had, and he's going to be going into private practice in San Diego. He's going to be presenting a case of one of my colleagues, Shane Purchase. So, Rafid, take it away in your suit. Thank you, Dr. Theologus. Uh, thank you for having us. And one of my favorite things about presenting is hearing Dr. Theologus uh, give a nice introduction and say nice things about me. So keep it coming. Um, so uh, this is our case. TH is a 55-year-old female with mid and low back pain. Uh, for seven years uh, that was worked up uh, at an outside um, institution and treated with a morphine pump. She had acute worsening of the low back pain after a motor vehicle accident two years ago. And of note, she's had 24 emergency room visits in three months prior to uh, her presentation to us for pain control. Uh, she rates her pain as 10 out of 10 in her back. Uh, she also reports uh, claudication symptoms uh, five out of 10 um, during her history and she has difficulty with activities of daily living. Past medical history includes a hyperthyroid disease, osteoporosis with a T-score of minus 2.9. Uh, she has a past surgical history of a total shoulder and the morphine pump was inserted. Um, that was actually seven years ago, I should say 2016. Uh, she's on morphine, she's on levothyroxine, she's on a bisphosphonate for the osteoporosis. She's been on that for a year prior to presentation. And she's on, um, she has uh, allergies to sulfa and doxycycline. She's divorced and uh, she's a former smoker. On exam, she is thin. She walks with an unsteady gait. Uh, she uses a walker. And overall, she is neurologically intact. Uh, she is tender to palpation over the spine. These are full standing x rays, and uh, we can look at the the. A AP first, and we see a coronal uh, deformity at the thoracolumbar junction and the lumbar lumbosacral junction. Uh, and then on the sagittal, we see uh, severe sagittal malalignment with uh, various compensatory mechanisms in place, including uh, flexion of the knees, retroversion of the pelvis, uh, hyperlordosis of the lumbar spine, and um, uh, lordosis of the cervical spine. 
This is a closer look at her spine x-rays. On the coronal plane, there is a 41 degree coronal uh, curve at the thoracolumbar junction. And on the sagittal plane, uh, we again see the hyperlordosis of the lumbar spine, and we see a positive um, alignment uh, with SVA of uh, 65. And there is focal kyphosis uh, in the thoracolumbar junction of 53 degrees. And if we look closer, we can see a compression fracture of uh, T12. This is a CT scan that was obtained and we see the compression fracture at T12. We see a vacuum disc a couple levels below. MRI was obtained overall unremarkable, uh, mild stenosis at that level, if any. And then because of the uh, lower extremity symptoms, we did obtain an MRI of the lumbar spine. There is lumbar stenosis, especially at the left side of the um, fractional curve uh, with foraminal narrowing. So this patient has a chronic T12 compression fracture deformity uh, with sagittal malalignment uh, as well as coronal uh, imbalance. And she has uh, also lumbar stenosis. So we elected to treat this staged. Um, the plan was uh, gonna be a T3 uh, to pelvis with a T12 PSO with inner body cages below to correct the foraminal um, stenosis as well as a few other reasons. So this was our um, uh, inner body work uh, from L2 to the sacrum. Uh, we performed uh, anterior to the psoas work uh, you know, an oblique um, lumbar interbody fusion. And we did stage this on two days. We came back the next day. And um, at that time, we did the T12 PSO uh, and then a posterior spinal fusion from T3 to the pelvis. Like Dr. Theolo just mentioned, uh, various, there are various ways to hold this construct uh, stable. Uh, we used accessory rods uh, with an iliac bolt as well as S2AI screws and um, we did use a cross connector over the PSO site. These were her follow-up x-rays at three months and we see a significant improvement in her uh, sagittal uh, alignment. And uh, she's very happy with the surgery. Uh, she is now uh, four months out. She has um, discontinued the morphine. Uh, she's weaning off oral pain medicine. Uh, leg pain is improved, back pain is uh, 80 to 90% better. It's a be beautiful case, Rathen. Thank you for presenting it. Um, nice job, Dr. Birch. And yeah, I, I was going to comment. Yeah, great job, Rafid and Alekos, uh, Aaron. Great, great cases and, and great presentation. I just, I think this this is an interesting case because you know it highlights the four rod construct. We're using dual headed screws here, and uh, you know fixation from um, you know we use S two AI screws, iliac bolts, satellite rods to connect long rods uh, into the satellite, uh, you know, the, the dual headed screws, and it just makes for an efficient construct. Um, and it really, and you, you know, choosing to do the PSO at T12, um, just kind of smoothed out the, um, the thoracic lumbar spine, kind of pushing the apex of the thoracic kyphosis higher where it should be. So I think, you know, cosmetically, she's pretty happy with, um, you know, how things look. And, you know, I, I honestly think that's that's an important aspect of the work that we do. I think it's a tremendous outcome. Um, it looks perfect. And I think this is a nice example of addressing the deformity where, where it is, um, not addressing it indirectly, um, and also restoring the appropriate shape based on Rousselia. She looks like a low PI. So you kept up her L4 to S1 lordosis and then kept her thoracic kyphosis, which she which she needs, um, you know, I think doing a low, say a lumbar PSO here in L4 um, would have not been the correct approach. You may have achieved, you know, globally re re realignment. But I think it would have thrown everything off in regards to um, the regional alignment in the thoracic and the lumbar spine. And I, she probably wouldn't be as happy. So I think it's a, it's a nice example of addressing the apex of the deformity rather than just putting a PSO down below. 
Yeah, Shane, I think you recognize one of the challenges here, uh, really nice uh, distribution of, of alignment here. And one of the challenges here is that she's so flexible in that lower lumbar spine. In fact, you sort of took away some of that lordosis, some of that compensatory lordosis uh, appropriately, because obviously if you had uh, just perpetuated that, then that would have uh, that that would have really led to an overcorrection. Uh, how did you how did you figure out exactly how much you wanted uh, from the L three to S one, um, meaning that you had to actually give a little bit of that lordosis back? So how how did you make sure you didn't overcorrect that? Well, I mean, I think there's some. I mean, I hate to say it, there's some art to it. And uh, after doing a lot of it, there's, you know, you, you know enough. Obviously, there's sophisticated, more sophisticated ways to do it. You can pre-op plan this stuff uh, algorithmically. I don't think I did that with this case, but I think that's more of a, uh, a surefire way of, of getting the, the correction, um, you know, appropriate. Um, but, but again, it's, uh, you know, it's, matching the, the pelvic uh, incidence with the lordosis, uh, understanding the Rusini type, not overcorrecting the lumbar spine, and, um, and then you know, smoothing the thoracolumbar junction out. It's, it's nice when the thoracic kyphosis is, is higher uh, rather than at the apex where it was, and obviously that was due to her, 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 uh, her fracture. Um, so, you know, I think I've learned a lot uh, from the sort of artificial intelligence stuff and it's taught me um, what I need to do. And so I'm at one point I was relying on it. And now I'm relying on it less because I feel like I've learned the lessons um, that I should have learned you know, way back when and, and under correcting uh, some people. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that's a, that's a, the most scientific answer, but I still do think there's, there's some art to this and um, looking at the spine interoperatively and knowing um, you know, how to shape somebody's spine is, uh, is an important factor of what we do. Yeah, I, I agree with Shane about keeping, keeping some art to the, to the uh, alignment. And again, it's a subtle thing, but I think uh, for, for people listening, uh, recognizing that sometimes giving back some lordosis in a compensatory part of the spine is going to be very important to get the right distribution. Uh, Shane, just for teaching points um, and so others can hear, in this case, why the why cover the whole spine? Why not just go three above, three below, uh, correct the focal deformity, and see how it does? Why go to the pelvis? Why go all the way up to the upper thoracic spine? Yeah, so good question. You know, she had, uh, you know, she had a degenerative scoliosis, facet arthropathy, and so trying to identify the the pain generator. Um, can be a little bit difficult. Often we'll use facet injections lower down to see if the lumbar spine um, facet arthropathy is a, a player. And, um, you know, I think that if we had gone short, her lower back had the propensity, you know, had, had the uh, a significant chance of degenerating further and she would have required a, a second operation. So I think sometimes it's false economy to do something short and doing something that's definitive um, we think about what we're taking away, what we're giving the patient. And by going to the pelvis with her presenting lumbar spine, I wasn't really taking away a lot. I wasn't taking a lot of, uh, a lot of mobility away. So I felt that it, I was giving her more than taking away. And that's sort of the rationale for going to the pelvis. But I will say a plug for the four rod constructs. I'm finding that the, the, the recovery, the kinetics of recovery of these four rod constructs is significantly faster than the two rod constructs that I used to do. And so I've, I'm really uh, leaning in, even when it's not a PSO, leaning in towards the, uh, the four rod construct now. I share the same mindset. Um, any comments or questions from, from the audience, the chat? Looks, looks like there was a question about uh, the, uh, Vishal asked a question about the psychological workup that's done uh, preoperatively for these major uh, revision surgeries. Yeah, that, that was a major, you know, issue with her. And, you know, she had probably 18 months of pre-op optimization, bisphosphonate, smoking cessation. She stopped her morphine pump prior to, uh, prior to surgery. And, and so she really jumped through all the hoops 
and um, and you know she was ready. Multiple conversations about what the recovery entailed, and so this was not like meet her, you get this massive big operation. This is eighteen months in the making, and she honestly she um, impressed me with everything that I asked her to do. She did it, and it took time, but. Um, you know, and I, at the end of the day, she became a very good candidate for surgery, and I think she's going to do really well. Yeah, it's important to make sure they're good citizens because they don't behave or follow your instructions before surgery. They're not going to follow it afterwards. Um, so we have four minutes left. Um, I'm happy to go to the third case, Sig, if you want to. You know, why don't I run this real, real quick in four minutes, if anybody, if everybody agrees, and. Uh, the idea there being to and maybe this is a bit of a different one. Um, we think about osteotomies or three column osteotomies along a spectrum. And again, Alecos, I think, did a terrific job of uh, describing that spectrum for facetectomies through a intraosteous osteotomy, which an osteotomy that includes the disc space to, to a complete vertebral column section. So, uh, one, one of our fellows, Jay Shaw, who, who wasn't able to join us tonight, uh, put this together as a case we just did last week. And I thought it was interesting. Uh, 56 year old male who uh, was an Asia A T12 paraparatic. He actually, uh, unfortunately, when he was 21 years old, was celebrating getting a new job and uh, drove his car off one of the cliffs here in California and became a T12 paraplegic. Uh, it was remarkably uh, functional and, and uh, worked as an engineer and, uh, and quite active. Now primary care doctor, care, care uh, primary care provider, provider for his elderly father. And he... Uh, developed an osteodiscitis at uh, L1-2 of the psoas abscess. It was treated for over a year with suppressive antibiotics and, and drainage. And um, uh, a lot of our complex cases certainly come from transfer from outside hospitals. So he had been an outside hospital for, for um, uh, about a year uh, prior to uh, his transfer to UCSF. And uh, if you can go to the next slide, um, this is how he presented on transfer. So he was septic in the ICU um, on pressors with this uh, really advanced uh, osteodiscitis involving uh, the L1-2 disc space with uh, um, near complete uh, dissolution of the L1 and the L2 vertebra. So again, this is just a recent case. I just thought in terms of the spectrum uh, of osteotomies and what we deal with. And, and uh, this was a, a challenging case because again, he's somebody who was, was septic, uh, there's a nice CT scan showing the extent of bone loss and uh, uh, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the chronicity uh, of this infection. So, so the question really became uh, how, how much to do here. Certainly, we wanted to, to shorten the spine. Again, he's T12 paraplegic, so uh, neural issues uh, wasn't much of a, uh, a question. But these are cases that we, we tend to do uh, from the back with a posterior base for section uh, getting a, a broad debridement, including the psoas abscess uh, from the back. And um, the, the question came, do we uh, go down to the pelvis, which I would normally do for a Charcot spine, uh, but somebody who's actively septic and in the ICU, could we do something uh, perhaps smaller that might be, uh, might, might be reasonable and then subsequently go to the ICU? So uh, go, go ahead and, and uh, go to the next. Uh, so we, we did this as a uh, uh, two-stage surgery. So at first, we went posteriorly, um, and we actually chose to stop at L4, which again, we had a lot of discussion about this with regard to post-operative mobility, uh, with regard to his uh, septic state when he came to the operating room. And uh, we took out all of L2. So, th so this should be a complete uh, resection of the L2 vertebral body. So I went from the L2-3 disc, took out all of L2, got up into the uh, L1-2 inner space, and actually in L1, I contoured the edges. I, there was enough bone in L1 to put a, a fixed axis screw in. One of the challenges of these cases is there could be a lot of translation. So I put in fixed axis screws in L1 and L3 and, uh, and shortened uh, the spine from L1 to L3 and put an inner body implant in there with a shortened spine. And then I went back uh, a couple of days later to uh, get the L3-4 level. So this is what that looked like uh, post-operatively was uh, screws in L1, screws in L3, they were fixed axis, short rods across there, and then a longer rod uh, go, going down to L4. And again, this is an unusual case where we chose to stop at L4. And uh, the reasons for that had to do both with his sepsis as well as uh, perhaps some 
uh, recognition of, again, this guy is pretty independent. He, he drives using hand uh, controls. And, and we thought that this might actually help him maintain some of his independence uh, without going down to the sacrum. So I think that is that the last slide there. Uh, and, and a big part of this reconstruction being to really try and shorten the spine between L1 and L3. And uh, he had a pretty pretty dramatic recovery with regard to his sepsis. Once we got this all debrided, he was able to get out of the ICU uh, within a day, actually. I, I agree, Jens, your comment that this is a Charcot arthropathy with a uh, uh, super infection. And it's the polymicrobial infection uh, that was superimposed on the Charcot arthropathy. But I'm curious, any any comments on would people have gone to the pelvis on this automatically? Um, uh, any any other thoughts or comments on how you how you deal with a a, a case along the spectrum? Say this is Jack Segler. I, I mean, your goals were were uh, very understandable. I just hope you're right, you know, because the experience with um, Charcot arthropathy, uh, particularly in an active uh, paraplegic, is usually uh, you got to go along or go home. You know? Yeah, usually I'd have a I have a low threshold to go to the pelvis on this, and and uh, again it had to do with his septic state as well as as well you know trying to keep this to a relatively smaller operation, but it, but as well as his uh, his impressive mobility uh, uh, before the surgery, uh, you know I, I do think that somebody who gets in and out of a pickup truck um, uh, sometimes that can be difficult when you fuse down to the pelvis. Yeah, no, I, I hope you're right, and I hope God's uh, holding your hand on this one. <laughs> Yeah, this was a great session. You guys are awesome. Really uh, very proud to have you participate and, and be partners in this thing. So 